system. It's a bit of a building side of the wall, but it's hopefully in years it will be much nicer. Now, first thing, um, I'll just talk you through the pathophysiology of the vascular patients. They, they have got um, atherosclerotic um, cardiovascular disease and it's a multi-organ disease, yeah? And um, you can broadly split them into coronary heart disease, cerebral vascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, and atherosclerotic or aneurysmal disease, yeah? <clears throat> Of these, the lot, you, you have about 50% of presentations happen as coronary heart disease, and most of the time we don't get involved with those because we are these. Most of the patients come with post MI rather than impending MI. Right? The medics and medical teams usually deal with about 50% of these cerebral vascular disease patients. And the rest of these <coughs> cerebral vascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, and aortic aneurysms or atherosclerotic disease present to our um, clinics or to us to have an anesthetic because they want to get things fixed, okay? Um, peripheral artery disease usually present as a functional or critical limb ischemia. That could be the first presentation. And in all of these patients, most important risk factors would be diabetes, hypertension, smoking, usually goes hand in hand with uh, peripheral artery, uh, sort of uh, cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemia, and premature history of um, um, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease also has a link, and obesity. So I'll um, go to the epidemiology. So if you look at the population, it's uh, male, female, sex. Um, in the young age group, young, young males are more exposed to cerebral vascular disease, sort of cardiovascular disease. And when you go to extremes of ages, they pretty much even out, so 50-50. Um, age is a main marker. Older you get, you're more prone to have uh, cardiovascular disease and peripheral arterial disease is the same. And if you take a population of 6 to 65, um, maybe 35% of people um, on, in the population, they, they will pr present you with a critical limb ischemia, but they could be walking around with a claudication. Smoking. Has a, goes hand in hand with um, cerebral vascular, sorry, cardiovascular disease. And um, heavier you smoke, you're more likely to have a vascular disease, as well as the form of disease will be much more severe. Okay? And diabetes, um, it, it is a risk factor, and it's not only <coughs> qualitative, it's also quantitative. So if you have <coughs> 1% increase of your glycosylated hemoglobin um, is associated with 25% increase of um, um, peripheral arterial disease. And if you have tenfold increase, you have tenfold increase of risk of amputation. So if, for example, if you're seeing a patient for um, limb, limb um, coefficient, so you, you know if they have diabetes, they're very high risk of amputation. If not, not today, but maybe a few months time now, down the line. Hypertension, um, not as significant as smoking and diabetes, but overall in cardiovascular disease, hypertension is significant. Okay? And dyslipidemia, um, you know, um, in the Framling study, they, they found that um, there's a direct link with the uh, <coughs> cholesterol and HDL cholesterol ratio to peripheral arterial disease. You know what the uh, Framling study is? Have you heard of it? It's a, it's a population-based study done in Massachusetts, in town called Framingham, and they got, um, got a sample of people uh, in 1950s, and then started just kept, kept track of them over the years, and then they found all sorts of things. One thing is this, because, but now there's a few generations going ahead, still they're continuing the study. So you can, if, you, if you Google it, you'll see the history of the study. Okay, um, so when I assess a patient, I usually go system by system so that I don't confuse myself. So I'll take cardiac as the first sign. So first, um, when the history asks with any, any uh, assessment, 
we can get uh, met um, from the history, the amount of uh, activity that patients can um, uh, do themselves. And more objective one would be a revised normal cardiac index. So if I just talk on those two, I'll just move to the next slide, sorry. Um, so the metabolic equivalent task, that's METS. And um, when you're sitting down, not, not exerting, not um, concentrating, just relax. You're using, generally we are using about 3.5 mils of oxygen per kilogram per minute. And that's considered as one MET. So the energy derived by using that much of oxygen is called one MET. Yeah. And <clears throat> these activities, this, this um, just normal home activities. So if you're if you taking a, doing a pre-assessment on a patient, you can ask what kind of activity they can do. Sweeping carpet, gardening, playing with dog. They all have attached uh, met value there. And there's a four, it's a gardening and moving furniture, must be very heavy, six, yeah? Um, and if you jump to the other side, you can see sports and leisure activities. So I'm, I'm not sure what kind of volleyball this is, but they're putting three into that. My volleyball is <laughs> It's a casual, I don't know what kind of casual volleyball is. <laughs> and, um, and then you go down the hill and football gives you a pen. Yeah. My favorite cycling is not in the graph, but I don't know where it is. Um, so it's cricket, yeah. It's not there either. No mats in that, is it? Yeah. <laughs> so now when you when you talk mm -hmm. to the patient, you get a rough idea of his about mets of five, yeah. And then you know you don't know whether this is this is the predictor value for this patient or not. So you can judge it by calculating like this. You put age into that for men, and then you get a number, and that will be your uh, are we giving these presentations to them? Well, it's on YouTube, so they can, oh, they can. access it themselves. <laughs> okay, and uh, and then for females, you can get this number. So then you know the predictor value, and you know who who's sitting in front of you that his number is this because you asked him your best values. Yeah. So that's a bit of history, and you could it's all dependent on patients <coughs> being very open with their actual capacity. Then you can go to a little bit more in depth. Um, so this is a Goldman's cardiac risk index. It's also called Lee's cardiac risk index. There are six factors in this. So there's high risk surgery. So anybody who's having vascular surgery, apart from a toe amputation, might be high risk surgery. Yeah? So if you if you're having toe amputation on the local anesthetic, that will be very high risk at that point. So. Ischemic heart disease, most of them have, you still need to look for it. Um, and cognitive heart, congestive heart failure, not all of them have it, but that's a potential. If you suspect, you need to investigate. And history of cerebral vascular disease, um, could be a TIA or it could be a stroke. Insulin therapy, so diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease doesn't have a good combination. Combined, they, they give you more morbidity and mortality. And um, preoperative serum creatine, that tells you about the renal failure. If you go into renal failure, then you can you can be high risk. So if you if you have you can give in each point a one point and you add up at the end of the history taking an examination or investigation and then you have a score. So score can start from zero to six the maximum is um, six. And so, but the classification is zero to um, three points. You get a class one to four. So if you if you look at the last line, classes one is a zero point. So there's no none of these risk factors are for this patient. Class four is he's got three risk factors. Yeah. So, and then you can see the risk of morbidity mortality. 0.4 with class one, point, sorry, 11% with uh, class four. So anybody who's got three, three points and positive on that, you're dealing with a very high risk patient, yeah? So I'm going back to the previous slide. 
So we go through the history bit. So we go into the examination for general pre-assessment. Pulse, what can you know from a pulse? Does any of you check pulse? Any? How many of you check pulse? I don't want to listen to heart sounds because I'm really kind of get a bit of an idea of the pulse. Okay, so you do heart sounds and not the pulse, yeah? Okay. And uh, that's fine. If you carry the stethoscope all the time, you can do that. That's the best way. Um, but with the heart sounds, the thing is that you can pick up a murmur and then you have to know what's that murmur? You don't know. So you need to go the full investigation of everything because you can't understand how to identify the murmur yeah, unless you really show sure that it's this murmur. Um, so, I go for pulse. Pulse will tell me what? Two factors? I don't want to relate too much. Two things that pulse will tell you? Regular one. Regular one. And another one? Right. Right. So, fast or slow. Those are the main things. And another thing that you can get from pulse, not from, from the periphery, is the volume. Yeah? If you feel the character, you can get good volume pulse or not. Yeah? And, um, and if it's irregular, what would you do? We jump to the investigation. What would you want to go if it's irregular? ECG of these investigations. And that ECG not brings it to you after two minutes. And it's normal. You can't see the irregularity in there. What would you do then? It's all here. Yeah, yeah just monitor for 24 hours. That will be the one that will pick up any parts, you know, changes, arrhythmias. That kind of thing. Heart sounds, as you said, um, heart sounds is good to do. You the you know, um, heart first heart seconds heart sound, added sounds, murmurs, all that can be picked up. And if you're very good at it, you can drop. You say it's coming from your heart area, it's coming from mitral area, and um, and then you organize an echo. Yeah? What is the downside of an echo? Because you're post the pulse here, you know? it's a static test. Static test, yeah. It's static, and then it doesn't it doesn't challenge. It's not challenge test, isn't it? Patient is not challenged with any kind of uh, stress. You can do a stress approach. You can, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a problem. So when you when next thing I would want to is a ventricular function test. Um, so for example, cardiopulmonary exercise test. That's a that's a functional test. If, you, if the patient, if most of our patients, if you put them through the treadmill, do you think they'll be able to do it? What is the problem? Is it the heart or is it something else? Co Co-education. The pain from the, all the muscles. They just walk, walk for three minutes, not 14 minutes, and then stop. That's it. That's it for me. And the CPAP test is no good for us, and that's not fully, fully effective CPAP test, so that's no good. So then we'll have to go for stress testing, yeah? Now, the downside with all this testing is that you have a time limitation. So if the patient is coming for a critical thing, you can't organize a CPAP test in two weeks' time. That's our waiting list, you know? two weeks to 10 days. So sometimes you have to do everything else that is available and then make a clinical judgment on the patient. I'll come to CPAP a little bit later. So then you come to the optimization of cardiac patients. So if you think there's some ischemic heart disease and it's ongoing and very acute, what would you do? Cardiac referral and the limb is dying off. Yeah? So what is what is your what is your balance? Where do you go? Most most of the time if it's critical ischemia and for the coronaries, they they get the priority for PCI. And it's, it's, once the PCI is done, they can have a peripheral vascular disease sorted out. But in the meantime, they might lose the limb. But you can't lose the whole patient just for the limb. Okay. Um, and the medications. So beta blockers, they've been in the research for a long time. What do you think about beta blockers? If they are beta blockers, they should be beta blockers, otherwise they won't start it. Don't start. Yeah. Why, why, why did they, when they did the studies, what happened when they started beta blockers? Uh, it's a stroke. It's a stroke. So, they, anyway, this population is high risk for strokes. You give them another chance to have a stroke. Yeah. So, if they are on, on beta blockers, um, keep it going. You can't, you can't stop it suddenly and then expect them to behave well in the theaters. 
So, but if they are not on beta blockers, um, you don't start it. They're high risk for stroke as well. Yeah. And um, antihypertensives, what do you do with them? So carry on. Which ones would you stop on the morning of the surgery? S inhibitors. Or the fancy ones, yes? Yeah? Because they just become, makes your life disastrous because they plummet their blood pressure with slightest proper fall and then just running after their blood pressure all the time. Okay. Um, so you need to pick and choose and tell the staff um, that we need to um, omit these drugs in the morning of surgery and um, <coughs> carry on. And anticoagulation. Anticoagulations have, as everybody knows, um, you have long acting anticoagulations and short acting ones. And when you consider anticoagulation, you need to you need to think of your anesthetic plan because I'm the anesthetist and I'm doing some anesthetic for this patient. Do I want them to be long term anticoagulation or do I want them to be short term? So if I'm planning for regional technique, then I will um, I will ask the surgeons to change the long term anticoagulation to short term one. For example, clopidogrel, I can't have clopidogrel and they will the operation stop it. It's no good. They will have a hematoma and have other complications. So when you see the patients in the clinic or in the wards, you need to pre-plan your anesthetic as well. So anticoagulation has to be dealt with. Statins. Anything about statins with vascular patients? Start it, stop it, carry on. Start it. If, you, if they're not already on it, you start it. Yeah? Uh, cerebrovascular, sorry, cardiovascular disease, the vascular multi-system disease and it stabilizes plaques and it has multiple you read about statins you have so, <coughs> so many indications starting and if they're not only starting and continue to work the operation um so what are our targets we've seen all this about the heart and my targets ldl cholesterol try to get it below 1.8 is it is it overnight doable no. so some of our patients can, doesn't fit onto this. Arterial pressure, we can do it over a few days at least, get it controlled. If it's not controlled, and anticoagulation has to be on some kind of anticoagulation. But rather, if I'm doing regional, I'll not have a yes. Yeah. So, we'll go to the next one. Now, um, so smoking, vascular disease, and um, then I'm going to the respiratory system. Goes res respiratory problems by COPD goes very much hand in hand with smoking. So that I'll discuss it a little bit further. So in the history, I'll I'll check for the pack here smoking, and um, this can be unreliable. They say, oh, I stopped it last week. Just smell the whole whole smoking, <laughs> whole clothes are all smelly smoking. So. Medication bags the worst. Yes, <laughs> and. And they're very can be very unreliable. I think they're doing a favor for themselves by telling us a lie, but it's not. They're, they're doing a bad thing. And any anybody who who's, who I meet in any anesthetic reassessment, I'll suggest I'll tell them to stop smoking. And if you can't do it now, do it over the next few months. That's my advice. Anybody, even my friends, I tell them to stop. But that's that's a good chance for you to get their concentration and tell them and give them a message. Yeah. Um, so, um, pack years is good indication how bad their chest is going to be. Symptoms, when you're, when you're hearing wheezing and coughing while he's sitting in front of you, that's a good indication that he's bad. And asthma COPD diagnosis, that is already on board. That, that is also, um, we'll have to look into carefully. And then if you examine the patients, most of the time I don't get a chance to examine thoroughly. But these um, shape of the chest respiratory sounds can be very, very less illustrated if you do them. And in the clinics, I do peak flow and sometimes pulmonary function, most of the time, pulmonary function chest if they got significant history of smoking and there comes the secret again. Okay. Um, I'll go to it a little later. So, management what do I tell the patient? What do I do? Reduce or stop smoking, ideally four to six weeks. And and direct them to the system system that they have 
in through GP practices where you can get patches and advice and all that. We refer them to that. And optimize medication. So for example, I had a patient who who came to clinic, this is not a vascular patient, who came to my clinic to have an nephrectomy, who had cancer. And he, he could barely walk and barely talk to me because his chest was so bad. And he's still smoking, his clothes are smelling of smoke. So I told him to stop smoking. It doesn't work, it's not going to work in two days. Then I asked, he, he was on inhalers, he was on. Um, um, he was on in, um, inhalers, but he was not on medication. So I referred him to the respiratory physicians, and then um, three weeks down the line, he came to actual pre-assessment day of the surgery. He was a different person. Just need to optimize their inhalers and bronchodilators, and sometimes have steroids. And if they if they have got infection on board because they're coughing up not the stuff that needs to be dealt with as well so there's no point bringing them in for a general anesthetic and then struggling for stop just pre up optimize them very well complete nicotine cessation is that helpful you can get it so they they all go into withdrawal like alcoholics do and they look they want to go off the ward and smoke and so if you if you get them on the with, Sort of, sort of stopping part, they're getting nicotine patches on and all that. They will not run off to smoke and all that if they can. So if you have limb problems, so they won't be running in the future. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now, so in, in depth into the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, so British um, Thoracic Society's definition is this um, airflow obstruction with which is not fully reversible and progressive. So however, however you treat them, they're going to be progressively worse. So in five years time, if you see the same patient, they, their numbers will be way off. They're going to get worse. Um, predominantly smoking. And this, as well as vascular disease, is smoking induced majority of the time. Yeah? Um, and they, you can classify it to chronic bronchitis and emphysema, and this is the baseline numbers. FE1, less than 80% of predicted is described as obstructive disease, and FE1 divided by FEC, less than 0.7, you all know that, gives that number. And then chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, bronchitis and emphysema, productive cough on most winter days in three consecutive years will fit the bill. For this patient, yeah, and and when you see end of the bed, the end of the chair, they'll be overweight, peripheral edema, and poor respiratory effort. But if you see an emphysematous patient, they have a histological diagnosis, and they have they have a dis terminal bronchioles, all the airways uh, damaged. But they'll be thin patients and tachypneic and the massage. Yeah. Um, so previous assessment. Like I told most of this before, we just need to judge all that and also the hospital and ITU admissions in the past, whether it's been intubated, ventilated, and um, and has they, have they been treated very well. Examination, um, this I mentioned before, dyspneic, most of the patients are dyspneic if they're not well controlled, and the respiratory pattern, these crackers, and this right heart failure. You can you can pill, um, detect this in the pre-assessment, especially with raised JVP and hepatomegaly and peripheral edema. If, if you see any of that, that's a bad sign because their right heart is failing, and under and general anesthetic they fail even further. So you need to get them optimized to the best. And investigations-wise, you can have chest X-ray, which would show as hyperinflation. Emphysematous bullet can be sometimes seen, and um, ECG because the right heart is straight in, in, in trouble, they have right heart strain. Polycythemia can be seen because uh, the hypoxic state in their blood. And if you're really worried, you can do a baseline arterial gas, which will tell you how bad the uh, CO2 retention and all that. Yeah. 
and these these tests if you, if it comes if you one ratio comes under sorry if you one comes under one liter or if you one to if you see ratio under 50 percent or psu to about seven you if you're giving a general answer you are ex, you expect to have trouble after the answer yeah so you can't expect to go send him to the ward um so he will have to be monitored and um treated in HDU stroke or ITU <coughs> and then another fancy test comes up cardiopulmonary exercise testing so we go into that so cardiopulmonary exercise testing what what do you have has anybody done it seen it or been an elite athlete and been on it yeah you have done it you physically done it or have you seen it, you done it? what's your AT? Why? Yeah, it's a good test, I think. It's, as long as you don't have a heart attack on it. Yeah. <laughs> so, why why do we go for this? Do you think it's very time time efficient, very easy thing to do? No. Why do we go for this? What's the reason? I went to study ages ago, and um, I older, most of the time, I do perfusions. Yeah. So you've been dichotomized into an, an hour of it threshold of less than 11. Yeah. And a higher patient of mortality rate. Yeah. So that's, that's, um, that's one good study. But 11 is a magic number in that, isn't it? Do, does all your patients fit into 11? I think, I think I, I'm quite skeptical of the effect. I don't think it's particularly... Yeah. So ba basically, my uh, idea of um, getting them analyzed through CPEC is that you get a test where you challenge cardio and respiratory together. None of the tests that I've did before <coughs> in the pre-assessment, like echoes and respiratory function tests, they're not working in tandem. They're in isolatedly working, and you think that chest is good, but heart is crap. So it doesn't go very well. You have to have both in, in, in synchrony, otherwise you will have trouble. And the thing with the um, with isolated resting tests is that you're not challenging the system, body system. So when you when you have a major operation and you don't recover as planned, or sort of within immediate post of you're not you plan for recovery, but you don't for some complication. Then it's like a marathon. You can't stop the marathon till they become well. So if the heart is heart and respiratory system is not challenged in an adequate way, they will not um, recover. And and when you do this test, which you, I'll go through it now. So ventilatory parameters wise, we look at VO2 of carbon dioxide excretion as a VCO2 and minute ventilation as VE. And the VO2 is product of cardiac output and arteriovenous oxygen difference. So if you're very keen on your physiology, this is a good test to go and watch and learn about, yeah? Read about it as well. There's a lot of articles in, online. And when you read about it, you just think very physiologically and, and it helps. So there's, there's a uh, concept called an aerobic threshold, and that's. Can somebody tell me what an aerobic threshold is? I'm just giving it interest so that you don't fall asleep. No, not the number, not the number. I want the principle. Switching metabolism switches from uh, aerobic and you start. You, you use, what the word, use the word switch, yeah? Yeah, it's a switch. Does, does, mean, does it mean that as soon as it happens, your aerobic metabolism has stopped? No, it's just a gradual. There is a, it's, it's where your anaerobic metabolism starts. Then, okay. Yeah, that's the right. Yeah, it starts to help out the aerobic metabolism. Yeah. Aerobic is struggling. Your anaerobic kicks in and then gives you a little bit more ATP. What is ATP? What is that? No, what, what is that? What is that? When you go to the shop, you give money. Yeah. What is ATP for the body? It's 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 the it's the, it's the um, currency it's that the body uses for getting energy. Yeah? ATP. So if you if you consider aerobic and anaerobic, 
which one is more efficient to produce ATP? Everything. How many? By how many? Three to twenty-three. Three to twenty-three. Yeah, that's why. They, otherwise, everybody will be going on anaerobic, isn't it? So it's a big difference. Anaerobic doesn't keep, cannot keep up with the workload. The body. It has to be aerobic, supported by a little bit of anaerobic. So if you go full, full on. So for for example, the same goal, If you put him through <coughs> kilometer of that speed of running, he will not keep up. Anaerobic will catch up, and then he'll have, he'll have stopped with the cramp. He can keep up to a certain level, but then as soon as anaerobic is overtaken, he really struggle because of what? Because of what? What is the metabolic effect? It's giving trouble. Lactic, lactic acid, yeah, it's an acid, so it, it's not conducive to healthy life. Okay? And so we, we Went through an aerobic threshold, so you've got a number for this patient that is in front of you, and you just need to judge whether that's um, that's suitable for this operation that he's planning to have. Yeah. Very hard call sometimes because um, the number doesn't doesn't tell you exactly what it is, and sometimes patients sit on the bike, doesn't do the full full on exercise that we expect them to do. So you get the false false numbers coming out of the testing. Now, what is the use of this? Yeah, what? I might stop. Um, uh, what is the use of this um, test? So you can you can. Risk prediction. So yeah. you can kind of plan, make it reverse measurement. Yeah. So that's all the other tests that we did before. Will give me a, give me an indication what what the um, whether it is high risk or low risk. But this now we have developed so many um, protocols and guidance. We can give a risk prediction score for mortality and morbidity, and that's very useful when you when you're sitting in front of the patient and you are discussing whether to go ahead of the operation or whether to change the plan of the operation. Or if you're sitting in an NDT meeting with the vascular surgeons and the other vessel balance team, you can objectively discuss um, um, how risky the pro proposed operation is for this patient. Yeah. As well as you can um, plan your period period. So other risk factors propping up from the CPEP test. You can plan for ITU bed. If without an IT but we won't go ahead, that kind of decision can be done before the operation. And um, it's not ideal. You should have IT, everybody should have IT with, I suppose. I'm fine. But um, if you if you ha have numbers to back your decision, then you can stick to the can and say we have to postpone it to the next day. You do the case and then we get support to your care in the board and have a problem. And we just can't say, oh, we told you so. That's not the case. We are responsible for the patient, as well as the surgeons. If you don't anesthetize the patient, the surgeon won't operate on it. So individually, you are fully responsible for the patient. So if, if, uh, if you are anesthetizing from a bad surgeon, you will feel stressed. I feel stressed. So when you anesthetize with general surgeons who are very senior, and then you have to go for a, a secure uh, doing appendix. It's hard work for me. Don't catch it there, do it differently. Yeah. Because if you don't anesthetize this patient, you won't have an operation. So you're responsible for it. him dying on the table. He dies. Yeah? Okay, now um, have you seen these plots? Anybody tell me a little bit about it? <coughs> So my my um, classification is like that, yeah. <coughs> now, if you if you do um, two, three, and five, they're looking at so one, two, three is like this: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. So two and three and five, two, three and five, they're looking at cardiovascular system. Okay. For example, now this has a VO2 HR 
VO2 divided by HR, that's called O2 pulse. In this uh, CPET world, it's called O2 pulse. Yeah? And um, so, and this brown thing is the heart rate, and the, this is the O2 pulse. So these two are corresponding because heart rate is going up, and the O2 pulse is, um, they, they have analyzed it to correspond with the, the stroke volume of the heart. So if the patient's heart is normal, this should be like this, going up at the same rate. This is this is when they stop the stop the um, test. Yeah, he stopped pedaling anymore. And then third one is also the same, but this is looking at VO2 and VCO2. And uh, this side is um, keep that now. This goes. Um, and then they, you see that this is crossing over somewhere here. Yeah. So we have to, in our normal day-to-day -day breathing, do you think we use more oxygen and produce produce less of carbon dioxide, or is one to one? Yeah, it can depend. On, does roughly, generally, we take it, take a number. Do you think it's under one or above one? Sorry. So that's that, that's where we started. Yeah, this under. The CO2 is just around there, and then it's exercising like mad, and then it suddenly jumps up. There's, when they're when they're overtaking CO2 production, that's for that's when the lactate is produced, and then then CO2 will produce more CO2 from its breathing. Yeah, and then he stopped the exercise. And then the fifth one, this is heart rate and VCO2 again, and the VCO2 is gradually going up. It's it's because the exercise is so intense, the VCO2 is gradually coming up. And then the ventilation can be looked at by looking at the one, four, and seven. This is um, uh, ventilation, VE. Uh, BTPS means, do you know what BTPS is? Body temperature pressure saturated. Yeah? So what is that? Body temperature is 37. Pressure saturated is? Pressure is going to be. Atmospheric pressure saturated with water. So, see, this is um, uh, time and uh, v, v is the volume. Uh, so, with exercise, you expect it to go up, isn't it? Volume, uh, the minute volume will go up. So, it's gone up and then you stop the exercise and it jumps. Yeah. And this is the same. Uh, minute volume and the VCO2 um, to keep up with the production of increased CO2 you know ventilation also increased oxygen requirement is increased so ventilation has gone up but if you have any problems with the breathing system this will, this will show up in this graph because it's looking at ventilation most of the time and then this is a minute ventilation and minute uh, CO2 I think I can't remember that one. Uh, no, this is tidal volume. Tidal volume and mean ventilation. And can your tidal volume go indefinite amount of time? So tidal volume is plateauing, really. So you push the push the body with exercise, it goes up, goes up, and then still still trying to go up and then it stops. <clears throat> it's plateauing off. And then the last one is six eight nine. So six eight nine. Yeah, can anyone explain one of those? That's the hardest. So yeah, mine used to do. I can't remember the exact axis, but it's going to be the efficiency of um, <coughs> ventilation per kilo efficiency. Yeah. So if you if you if you have a um, patient who's got um, uh, ventilation mismatch, ventilation per kilo mismatch. Would you see it somewhere else, apart from these three? You might see some other some ventilation because they're often so run together. Yeah. So, yeah. Have so if you if you come up, if you have a patient who's had PE and one one pulmonary artery or part of it is yeah. blocked off, you get a um, difference that will officially come up on here. But if you have a COPD or respiratory problem, they will come up here. Yeah. 
So if you're really keen on physiology and just read about this, read one article and go through these graphs, and then become really clear and very interesting. Okay. Any questions? Oh, this is the magic uh, 18 number, 11. And most of my patients are like that. This is from the older study. They, they use the 11 as a number, but I don't think that's, 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 that's uh, not clear cut. The number is right on it. So what's your reservation about the CPEX? Um, I did a big systematic review mm -hmm. looking at all CPEX articles since that study. Yeah. Looking yeah. at the predictability for cardiovascular complications and mortality. Mm -hmm. And there's no consensus and a lot of the studies were really poorly designed. Yeah, when you do systematic reviews on poorly conducted studies, because systematic review becomes uncomfortable. Yeah. But, but the, when I have a CPEC test, which is really bad, we very, very clearly point down to the patient. Yeah, I, see, I think its use is in a global thing. It's really useful for us to have a global assessment of the patient. Yeah. But I think it's not the, only the, one the difficulty I have is people using a number to, to sort of say whether or not someone can operation. Okay. As long as you're comfortable to me. So we don't have a you number. Can't have this Do, does your hospital have a number that you. Okay. Okay. No, no. Because uh, we don't use it as a clear cut number. Yeah. We use the mortality morbidity, but AT will be part of that. But. If it's not eleven, we are not giving you an operation. We don't say. Yeah, I've seen it's, a lot of it's, a, it's a holistic thing. As you yeah. said, it can't be taken individually by a code. Even though it's a it's a functional test, you can't say use a one number to give it, give an operation or not. Yeah. So you, you have to take everything else in the picture. If the if the CPEX is bad, you can always discuss with the surgeon in an MDT setting. Mm -hmm. And change surgery into a mild, mild version of it. Because if you think it's very high risk, and you can change the anesthetic if you think it's, it's more of a respiratory component showing up in CPEC, and you try to do a regional technique, not to the general anesthetic. But sometimes the operation is so complex you have to do a general anesthetic. Um, I think I'm coming to almost end. So peri-optimization, we went through most of this, smoking cessation and reduction. And in any operation, if you see a patient, tell them all to stop smoking, yeah? Uh, optimal pharmacological management, bronchodilators and antibiotics. Physiotherapy. So these two, going with physiotherapy, improves their chest quite a lot. But the problem is physiotherapy appointments will not happen as quickly as you want them to happen. And have you heard of preoperative exercise programs? Does your hospital have one? We don't have. We don't have it. Have you seen it? It's very, very, very good actually. If you have a few weeks, they, they you don't. <coughs> if you get a patient, for example, he's, he's one of these, you can't ask him to do an exercise. But if you have a patient who's mobile in the, in the house, you correct their physical pathology. <coughs> <clears throat> cardiorespiratory numbers with medication and everything. And then you can encourage them to do a little bit more than what they do now. And over time, within three, four weeks, they improve their, their physiology. There's a really good review in the BJA, um, either this month or a couple of months ago, on pre rehabilitation. And, um, and it's, it's, it's going to happen all around. I think it's like CPET, it's going to catch up with the old hospitals in time. Um, so anesthetic management, uh, this is just a generalized one. So I, I like to do regional anesthesia as much as I can. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't get an epidural last yesterday, but uh, it does happen for everybody. Um, and if you're having a respiratory cripple, don't give them a phrenicular block or a intercostal block. Um, and ventilation, <coughs> if you, some operation you can't do with the regional, whatever you say, say and do. So give them the safest anesthetic. So keep watch out for their barotrauma, atelectasis, hypoxia, hyperventilation. You know all these can happen. Just watch out for them. 
body cavity surgery. Why do you think body cavity surgery is high risk? Is it because of the surgery or is it post op period? Have you seen them post op second day, first day in the bed? Have you seen them? Then do why why don't they do anything? Well, no, it hurts. So why why is it hurting? Because then it's disturbing that, yeah. It well, shouldn't hurt. Well, because well, if you can't, the regional didn't work. Yeah, didn't regional work didn't work. So so you you give a regional, for example, you give an epidural, you wake them up, and what happens? He's screaming in pain. Mm -hmm. So you know that it's not working. So is there a way to salvage? <laughs> so it is here, yeah. That's not a good salvage. For me, I'm more regional man. So. Recited. Recited, yeah. Or do a rectal sheet catheters. Yeah, if it's a midline incision, I would do rectal sheet catheters. Or some other, like, depending on what. Have you heard of um, 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 erector spinal blocks? So that's a rescue. You can rescue a epidural with erector spinal blocks. So, but we have to do both things. Um, the, so rectus sheet catheters is hard work when they're awake and turning you off because we're breathing like mad and then they strain and cough and all that. But it is fine is in the back, they don't feel that. You numb it and do it, you can take your time and with ultrasound with you and just read up on the rectus spine if you haven't heard of it yet. It's, it's a good block, it's, it's been introduced recently, maybe a few years, not that recent. But, uh, it, it can salvage your epidural. The epidural comes out and you do two blocks on the epidural. It is fine, maybe C5, C6 level. Sorry, T5, T6 level. C5 is too much. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then, then you, within a within few minutes, they'll get a benefit. But you can't do one off block. You just need to keep a catheter What area does it cover? It'll cover the so you're putting it at T5, yeah. and it usually it goes about four levels down. So you, main thing is you cover the top part of the abdomen. That's the worst pain that most of the people complain of. So you can't say that my anesthetic didn't work. You just need to take some more time and sort him out, or you chuck him out. Really. So if your epidural fails, then there's ways to sort it out. Just need to learn how to do it. What's the safety of that with the anticoagulator? You're not going near any vessels, yeah. and so you're going, you're going. If you, if you go the trans, you can see the transverse process on the um, ultrasound, and just hit the needle onto the transverse process and give the bolus, and then there'll be a space created, and the needle So it's that simple. Is that it's done by EDs in US? Yeah. So that's the first block which they use for. Yeah. They, use they don't do catheters, but they... Because with laparotomy, you, your pain relief really is needed for another three days. Yeah, because it started with thoracic analgesia, basically. Mm -hmm. It's a bypass done by most of the emergency practitioners or emergency department people, so that they don't have to do paraverticals. Paraverticals is much more risky. It is. Yeah. So it's, it's very easy. So read it out and then you will see how easy it is. And you just take a hands on scans with somebody who not has done them. And then all the rib fractures, laparotomies, even, even so, if, if, I, if I have, sometimes you don't go in to do a laparotomy and then end up having a laparotomy, so no, you can't do anything wrong. Well. You can, this midline, you can do a um, catheters, rectal sheet catheters, bilateral. If it's unilateral, so cross incision, then you can do a rectal spinal block on your back before the patient wakes up. Scan the back and then do it. But whatever you do, you do it, ideally do it before the patient wakes up, so you get it in the right place safely. But if you're not, if, if you have to do anything after waking up, do something in the back. So they don't move with the breathing that much. So that's any, anything intra-abdominal, so anterior abdominal wall will be the challenge. Would you do it in a patient where like an epidural is quite <coughs> Like <coughs> the rectal sheet catheters can hit the vessel. This is the artery is there, so that's a risk. So it's fine, it doesn't go near any vessel. But 
any block is a bit risky, you can have bleeding around it. But um, most of the time, surgeons will be worried about going to surgery with tropical blood on board. Apart from, apart from the carotids. Carotids I take to um, uh, go to theatre with the tropical blood on board, and I block with Salaka Texas blocks, and I do them away. So if you know if you know your anatomy and you, you scan a few times before, this is the time post the pass you need to scan and scan everybody, even your colleagues. Okay? And then learn how to use the machine. Okay. And um, so opiate based, uh, I, I I'm very sort of I don't use that much morphine unless I really have to. Um, so respiratory depression is an issue with COPD type of patients and elderly patients, they get really so happy their lives still not doing anything. Okay? And, and that is not what you know, we need. We need ambulation. We need them coming out of bed and doing all sorts. Yeah? So uh, now, diabetes is linked with peripheral <coughs> arterial disease. If you have diabetes, you, you're very prone to have complications. So you History, sometimes the patient don't know. Yesterday, this patient didn't know that he's diabetic until he did the blood sugar in the hospital. So that's possible potential. So history might not be reliable. They can have neuropathy, uh, nephropathy, and retinopathy. Um, most of these might be diagnosed before if it's established diabetes. And <coughs> HbA1c levels is something, we need something like that for smoking and alcohol. Have a number over the last few months how, how well controlled you are. Say, somebody says, or oh, not so much for the last six months, test is wrong. So, this this one, nobody can hide it. If their control is poor, it will pick up immediately. And um, and if it's if it's more than 8.5, just get the direct team in all ASAP. If he needs to control himself. Otherwise, the recovery and the process of going through surgery is a waste. We need to have complications from somewhere. So American um, Diabetic Association has very uh, target is under seven, and European is under six point five. And that is if you don't have cardiovascular disease. And people with cardiovascular disease, the number is take with HbA one is around seven seven point five. And and these patients. Cardiovascular disease or life expectancy under 10 years. So, as everybody knows, hemoglobin is essential for oxygen carriage. And the current guidance is 12 and 13, female and male. And um, what do you do if you if you're free as a small? The morning of the surgery, most of the vascular patients have been seen before. So we know beforehand that their HP is low. But if you if you have a critical limb ischemia who person to AME and then you have a low HP, what do you do? What options? One option, two options. You take a patient with the AT of hemoglobin to muscular revascularization. Give a DA. Would you? No. Um, what, what do you do there? Yeah. He's coming with critical limb ischemia. You can't send him home and come back in two weeks time. Yeah? And then he's going to lose his leg. We're trying to keep him safe as possible. Right? Get the HP off. If he's not having an operation, I will not transfer the whole it off. If he's having an operation and he suddenly bleeds something about the liver, and if it's HP of 80, we will be really struggling keeping him. If you don't transfuse periop or intraop, he will, he will <coughs> if he has catastrophic bleed, he will, he will not have very good footing to back him up. You know, we need to get him, him up his HP levels. But if you have a patient who's got a triple A of um, 5.7 or just coming near 6 and going for elective triple A and coming with HP of 90, what do you do?
for for iron. Have you seen that? Have you asked your husband what iron looks? How we iron it? He said, is, does that give anaphylaxis or reactions or not? Have you heard of that? It's common. We, we send it for it. It can happen. They can have severe reactions to iron. It's less common than penicillin. Yeah. Very weak sensor. So if you listen to Anthony Klein talk, the manure preparations and flaxes is less common than the new preparations of IBM. All oh, right. It's with penicillin. Is it? Yeah. All oh, right. And um, the I don't know whether we use the same combination. Yet. So which which brand is it? Monosaur fair injection. I don't know. I don't know. We use fair injection. Yeah, we use. Is that less common then? Yeah. All oh, right. And less common than an adverse reaction from a blood transfusion. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Um, the um, what was that? Uh, the oral line is is an option if you have about three four weeks, uh, but then if it doesn't correct, then I'm placement with um, IV iron has to be utilized. Yeah. We have an um, clinic, so you can do that if you pick up pick them up on uh, um, pre-assessment. So BMI in both extremes is not good. If you have a 35 or above, you, your risk of bone infection, thrombomelic disease is very high. And if you have, if you have high BMI or under, uh, under 18 BMI, you, um, you can have um, um, wound effect, sort of wound recovery, can, because your nutritional state is poor, you can have wound infections common in both extremes. So nutritional, improving nutritional state can be, can be a challenging task. You can't tell them to eat for, sometimes you have energy drinks and all that for energy, but for nutritional state you have to have a balanced diet, which needs some time. And, um, and sometimes you don't have time for this patient. Uh, what do I have? So you assess them very thoroughly in the clinic, and you've got a lot of friends, history and examinations and all the numbers. And now you haven't done a CPEX for this patient. Is there a way of getting mortal demography numbers? So this is on the vascular anesthesia website. We have a, a this possum uh, calculate on it. And if you go to the website, you can see it as a link. So that's, um, and once you enter all the details, it's mo most of the details are straightforward. There's no nothing extra that we need to look up for. And um, <clears throat> so even the operative severity, um, what do you think the vascular patients are coming to? Thank um, major, major plus, major and major plus. There won't be anything less than. And um, the blood loss, sometimes surgeons say I was less than 500, but full stop, it might be a bit, a bit more than that. Um, Peritoneal soiling, most of the time doesn't happen for vascular, even the AAA patients. Um, and other, these, these are all pre assessment things. So you can get a Mortal morbid number. So just because you thought before the operation, patient didn't need ITU, doesn't mean that they didn't need ITU ever. So intra op perioc, you can redo the mortal morbid scoring, and then then request for ITU bed. Bed availability might be different, but if he needs a bed, he needs a bed. Um, so what are the periodic considerations? So you see, see this patient in your mind, you're thinking, what am I going to do with this patient? I was supposed to talk. I think I was going to only a pre-assessment, but I will not stop this. So monitoring-wise, what do you, do you think monitoring is important for vascular patients? So if I tell, tell all the vascular patients should have outline, would you agree? Now all is all is not all is right. So, so sometimes you don't need it, but I have very high threshold and you are not. Even in the rest of my practice I do I do have very high threshold to do outline. 
It gives me gives me indication of patients having access to instant provided it's not banned rubbish outline. It, it should give me a good good reading. Um, and then I, I'm thinking of uh, whether it's a general aesthetic or regional aesthetic, um, because they, because of the patient's comorbidities, yeah, and assessment. So, so if in, in a patient that I can give um, general, I have to give general aesthetic there. It's a midline incision and a triple leg, and I can't do a regional aesthetic alone, but. You can do a regional anesthetic for post op and anesthesia, like an epidural, and then you do a general anesthetic. And the, yeah, and, and the pre perfusion is another issue when you when you anesthetize these patients, because if they're metabolically unstable, just normal day to day, they will take, take the re perfusion when you, when you unclamp the arteries, you get um, lactic acidosis according to the physiology. Which will be taken up as a difficult problem. Okay, so you have to watch out for reperfusion. And uh, post operative con consideration, depending on the assessment, we need to decide whether he needs a definite ITU bed. And then watch out for MIs in vascular patients because they have cardiovascular disease. They can have 72 hours after the operation sometimes. Expect respiratory complications and Provide good analgesia, including blocks and all that. Normothermia, just to encourage good coagulation. Oxygen, <coughs> just to avoid hypoxia and um, continue all that. I think I don't have any time for questions. We can do, we can do questions quickly. Okay. While I set up the next speaker. Yeah. Anything you want to clarify or ask me? But please do read up on CPEC and then this is the picture of the Some questions? Are we okay? Thank you very much, Sasha. Thank you very much. Go back to the other slides. Okay, let me start sharing. Which one? Yeah. You know the um, bleeding guidance that I had and the bridging guidance. The other yeah. two. Do you want that open as well? Yeah, yeah, is it okay? Yeah. <laughs> Just so that I can switch. Um, so, uh, it's only a draft, so uh, okay. there are people from other places, right? You yeah, said, so people might have different written guidance. Yeah, so there's that bridging guidance yeah. and the oh, other indications, that's right. Okay. Okay. Um, yep. Hang on one second, I just need to put it on. Are these people are senior registrants, or yeah. are they across senior registrants? Hi guys, I'm going to go on to the next selection, um, and then we'll have a break after that. Yeah, so this is um, Dr. Bonner, consultant hematologist at Colchester Hospital. Hello. I'm one of the hematology consultants, so we've got people from all over the region, right? So I'm sure the bridging guidance might be different across different hospitals, but more or less very simple and straightforward with the DOACs. 
So you've come across Joax in your day-to-day -day practice, more along reversals, or is it about bridging, or what sort of things have you come across with Joax? Reversal. So what have you used for reversal? Um, Nothing. <laughs> it's very simple. It's That's true. To be using um, transformers, like very yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's telling us that any other reversal awesome. agent that you've used, because there's an antidote for one yeah, of them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Has anybody used it? Yeah, I have. the free search on it a bit? <coughs> Sorry, there's not yeah. much good testing to show how effective it is. No, no, Braxby is uh, nice and true. It is quite effective. It is an antidote for uh, which one? Yeah. Dabigatron, yes. Yeah. So, but we don't use so much of Dabigatron in uh, BTE practice. It's more in the atrial fibrillation setting and cardiology and stroke physicians use more of Dabigatron rather than, you know, that. So, Dabigatron, how does it work? How are the others? Okay, so I wouldn't grill you more. Um, so this is how the evolution of anticoagulant works. <coughs> so initially, we all knew about heparin. Heparin is what we used. How does heparin work? Factor 2 is factor 10. And uh, then we had the warfarin. Do you know how warfarin came about? The discovery of warfarin. There's just a bit of story behind it. That's uh, cows died. That's right. Yeah. So it was called, yeah. It was in the 20s in the Canada and North America, so when we had the Great Depression. Many of the cattles were bleeding to death. They didn't realize why these cattles were bleeding to death. So it was basically the cattle which were feeding on the sweet clover, the hay, which got mold in it, so was making them die. So that came about the discovery of the dichromerols. And what was it used for first, initially? Poison. Yeah, it's a rat pesticide, and then turned out to be what we use for the last 70, 80 years. We've got a lot of practice with warfarin. And then came about the low molecular weight heparin, and then the direct thrombin inhibitors and indirect factor 10 inhibitor, and then the <laughs> DOAX. So initially it was Dabigatran, which we came about in 2008, Rivaroxaban, Epixaban, and Edoxaban. So these are the four drugs that we use now, and it's all nice approved in the UK. So this was a traditional anticoagulant. We had loads of problems with fra unfractionated heparin. You know, it needs intensive monitoring. Even in these days, we struggle to put a heparin infusion and monitor the APTT. Even, even ITU, we always have problems. So we tend to try and avoid using it. <coughs> it needs dose adjustment based on the APTT ratio, and there's a risk of hit. Okay? And low molecular weight heparin, we use more and more because it's, again, parenteral administration. The dose is based on the weight. And uh, the risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is not so much like unfractionated, but still it is there. And then we know about the oral antigen. So what are the disadvantages of warfarin? If I talk to a patient and counsel them for anticoagulation, <coughs> I talk about both and then make the patient decide what they want. Some people are happy being on the warfarin because they like the fact that the drug is being monitored and they know it's working well in the system. But it's a big headache because it's got a very narrow therapeutic window and it interacts with the food and drugs, almost you name it, it interacts, and it needs frequent monitoring. So for a working person, it's very difficult to keep going for their INR monitoring and the dose suggested. So we needed something that would be very practical and ideal. So what are the qualities of an ideal anticoagulant? Something that could be oral, and no significant interaction, predictable response, and no need for monitoring, and it'd be better if it's a fixed dose rather than the dose being changed every now and then. And ideally, once daily, but that's okay. Epixaban is given twice a day. And there's not much side effects with I mean, there shouldn't be much side effects and better safety profile. So uh, this is just looking at across the board, uh, low molecular weight heparin, unfractionated heparin. What's the point here? It does not work. Oh, okay. Uh, unfractionated heparin, fondoparanox. Have people come across fondoparanox? But the problem with it is it stays in the system for too long, and again, there's no antidote. We really struggle if somebody comes in with a bleed of fondoparanox. There's not much we can give. At least with the newer anticoagulants, no longer newer, the non-vitamin K oral antagonist, which is Dabigatron, Rivaroxaban, Epixaban, and Edoxaban, we are short-acting, so which is much better than fondoparanox. This is a 
lovely. I'm sure you've all read this quite a few times across various exams. So if you see in a clotting cascade, you have, you know, if you do a coagulation screen, it's just basic questions. Prothrombin time, APTT, and some hospitals do fibrinogen as part of the clotting cascade. Some people don't do. So if your PT alone is isolatedly elevated, what do you think? The reason? What do you? So APTT is normal, PT is normal. So, so APTT is normal, PT is prolonged. Yes, prothrombin time. Warfarin or? Factor seven deficiency. Yeah. So if you have a problem in your extrinsic pathway, which is just a factor seven, you will have an isolated prothrombin elevation. If you have a problem in this pathway, which is an intrinsic pathway, be it 12 deficiency, 11 deficiency, nine deficient or eight deficient, it will be the APTT, which will be prolonged, but the prothrombin time will be normal. Unless it's grossly abnormal, then you could have some kind of a PT prolonged as well. Warfarin elevates the APTT as well, but it's yes, really yes, in really, really high doses of you know lots of warfarin in the system, the APTT can be affected as well. That's right. And any problem in the common pathway, five or ten or two, then it will be both the PT and APTT elevated. Or deficiencies in fibrinogen, then again both PT and APTT will be elevated. Factor twelve deficiency, have you come across? So many times, I'm sure, when you have when you're seeing a patient in the pre-op assessment clinic, say the APTT is prolonged, isolated APTT prolonged, normal <coughs> prolonged time, and the patient 60 years old, not bleeding, no problems at all. What goes in your head? Should you be worried? Is there any? Is Sorry. There's no bleeding history. It's not significant. That's right. But still, you wouldn't want to take this right to data, right? You still want to know what's the cause. So what are the causes? where there's no bleeding significance, but the APTT is prolonged with a normal PT. Anything that you've come across? Mm -hmm. Glucose anticoagulant, yes. And again, factor 12 deficiency causes isolated APTT prolongation, and factor 12 deficiency is not of any bleeding significance, so you don't have to worry. And then the commonest thing is lupus anticoagulant. So lupus anticoagulant, again, uh, doesn't cause any bleeding significance, it's more thrombosis, so you have to be worried about thrombosis for access. And um, how would you know there's a lupus anticoagulant? What would you tell the lab to do? Oh, Sorry? <laughs> yeah, you could do the cardio antibody, but sometimes they could still be negative with just a positive lupus anticoagulant. So all you have to get them to do is a 50-50 mix. Because there's an inhibitor, it won't get corrected, and then you ask for a lupus anticoagulant, that will do it. So, that's with the public. Any more questions on coagulation screen before I skip to the next one? Uh, INR, can it be isolated, elevated without PT and APTT? No, INR is a reflection of the prothrombin time. So, so if the prothrombin time is normal, will the INR be still raised? No, no, it mostly will be normal. Because you're still in one, I would say probably 1.3, 1.4, my not sure. So, there was a patient uh, uh -huh. whose PT was normal, APTT normal, but INR was still two without any. Obvious, not on any basis. It's bizarre because I don't know, it's basically. It was smooth, yeah. Yeah. That's why even I was surprised. I thought it was a ratio. Ratio of the prothrombin, the standard prothrombin. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I thought it was PT was within normal range. I can't remember that, but just recently. In Colchester? Yeah. In Colchester? Yeah, I'm working in Yaman. Oh, okay. Normally, the prothrombin time is usually a reflection of the people in Yaman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go to the next slide. So, with the DOAX, people call it differently direct oral anticoagulants. NOAX is newer oral anticoagulants. As I said, they're no longer newer. You could make it non vitamin K oral anticoagulants. Advantages being it's oral, it's effective, as effective as warfarin, a better safety profile. So, shorter half life. So, it's a quick onset and quick offset of action. So that's why even if somebody comes with a bleed or needs a surgery, it's much better. I mean, I wouldn't say much better. Of course, we call us, there's no antidote, we just say they can still bleed, all the story. But basically, it wears off very quickly because of a shorter half-life. And uh, no INR monitoring, as you all know, and there's not much of drug and diet interactions, very few drug interactions. The only problem is the patient has to be compliant. If a patient is not compliant, then the drugs are not going to work because they're all very short acting, quick onset and offset of action. And when I met here, Debbie Gadron and Edoxaban require bridging that is more 
for VTE treatment, when you start treatment, they need low molecular weight clexin for the first five days. Whereas with the dubaroxin and apixaban, you just stop the medication straight away. I am going through the doses next. Disadvantages, no available antidote apart from dimigatron and no readily available monitoring. Not all the labs can do those special tests. You know, the 10A level calibrated by apixaban and dubaroxin. And in the middle of the night, you might not have a BMS in the lab we can do it as well, so it's all a problem. And uh, of course, we don't have long-term data. So any condition that the DOAX cannot be used, do you know any of the situations where the DOAX cannot be used and you have to use water and valves? Sorry, what did you say? Valves. Valves, yes, yeah, mechanical valves. Any other conditions? Allergy. Allergy, yes, okay. But you could try another medication if you have to run out of all four. Because I have patients who have had problems with the peroxidin, but they are okay on the pixelan. Yes, that is the point too. Yes, any other conditions or special circumstances? And so HVT? You can use, of course it's not licensed, I'm going to talk about it next, but any other conditions? Pregnancy, you can't use to ask. And pediatrics, again, it's not licensed yet. And any other conditions? Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Again, we don't know the safety and efficacy of the DOAX. So we prefer to use warfarin. Only if you have big problems with warfarin, then I compromise and use a newer antiquarian, but it is not used. Renal failure. Any creatinine clearance less than 15, we prefer using warfarin rather than DOAX is contraindicated. So pregnancy, metallic valves, APLS, again, extremes of weight. More and more we see people coming in with weight more than 120 kilograms. I'm sure you see when you're giving anesthesia for all your patients, high BMIs. We don't know the efficacy of it. So anybody more than 120, again, I tend to avoid using DOAX and can counsel them for using Klaxin and what can we use We don't have studies because, you know, usually the target range is, again, three to four. So the DOAX work in such a way is between two and three. Of course, there are studies going on, but it's not approved. So we might in the future. It might be in the future, yes. And again, people with recurrent VTE who needs a high INR range. You know, normal INR, we want it between two and three. Yeah. So, but if somebody is needing higher INR, three and four, then I tend to use Warfarin. So this is just kind of the pharmacokinetics. The last one, Betrixavan, is not here, but I think it's got its latest FDA approval in the US for thromboprophylaxis. So as you can see, sorry, I don't have a pointer. Um, it's all got a very short half-life. And they have a quick onset of action. As you can see, the peak concentration you can achieve within two to four hours in general of taking the drug. Not much of drug interactions apart from the peak glycoprotein pathway and the cytochrome P450. And um, Debigatron is renally illuminated. So are the others. So in renal impairment, they might stay in the system for much longer. So when you call a hematologist, when you have an emergency surgery or um, bleed, we would like to know when they took the last dose, what the renal function is, because that makes a difference. And they all have to be dose adjusted for the renal function. And antidote, not yet available, apart from dabigatron. So this again summarizes. One important thing is there's not much interaction with food, but apart from rivaroxaban, it's very important when I'm counseling patients or when we counsel in the clinic, we tell them that they have to take it with food for the maximum absorption. And uh, the absorption is not there, that the pharmacokinetic it just gets better absorbed and the peak level comes only up with food if you take it with food. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything. So we just say, just take it with so food. So not empty stomach. Hmm? That means not empty stomach. Not empty stomach, yes. Yeah. So. As I said, they're all nice approved. So they could be used for all your elective hip and knee, the thromboprophylaxis, apart from edoxaban. It's used for stroke prevention in AF, non valvular AF, and PE and DVT. And the rivaroxaban is recently got approved for ACS as well. I don't think you need to know much about VTE treatment, but there are three phases of treatment. When you know with the traditional anticoagulants, you always top them off with heparin and then you change them to warfarin. Whereas, as I said, with the newer anticoagulants, rivaroxaban and apixaban can be dosed straight away. It doesn't need any bridging clexane. Whereas for debigatron and eudoxaban, you need clexane for the first five days. 
I'm sure you're not going to start treatment for any of your patients, so you don't need to know. This is how the dosing of the NOACs for the VTE. So they all have a loading dose for the first few days. <coughs> and the Begatra and the Nidoxaban has the Clexin, the low molecular weight heparin. And then for ongoing treatment varies between three and six months. Some people are kept on long-term anticoagulation based on the risk factors. The dose adjustments for atrial fibrillation is a bit more complicated based on the creatinine clearance. Again, I'm not going to go deep into it because you're not going to be doing it. The only thing to say is creatinine clearance less than 15 mils per minute. All the NOACs are contraindicated. So cancer-associated thrombosis. We all still use low molecular weight heparin as a standard of treatment. And uh, so even the ASCO guidance and the ACCP guidance says low molecular weight heparin preferred over vitamin K antagonist or DOAC therapy. And normally you tend to extend it for a longer period rather than just three months for all the VTEs. But we have had two trials. One was a select day trial where all the cancer it was run here and where the cancer patients who developed a DVT, be it upper arm DVT or lower leg DVT or a PE, were randomized between deltapyrin and neuroxylin. And this is the outcome from it. So VT recurrence, 11 person with deltapyrin and four person, major bleeds were more or less the same, but the clinically relevant non-major bleeds were slightly higher in the neuroxylin arm. So what we tend to use is, we tend to say use rivaroxaban, but we tend to avoid it in upper GI cancers or lower GI cancers, or with sometimes with active prostate malignancies as well because of the risk of bleeding. But otherwise, if somebody is struggling with clexin injections, I use more and more rivaroxaban and apixaban in those patients. And similarly, this is other trial, which is the edoxaban trial, the Hokusai cancer trial. They compared delta parin with edoxaban, and as you can see, it's more or less efficacious. Of course, his risk of non-major bleed was slightly higher, but we started using more and more rivaroxaban and indoxaban in our cancer-associated VTE as well, apart from the GI cancers and the ones which are associated with higher mucosal and bleeding. So routine coagulation monitoring, not needed. Unless you're worried about something, then I wouldn't. I'll talk to you when I tend to monitor or look for a rivaroxaban or epixaban level. So they don't need routine monitoring. And we tend to use it in certain situations where a patient has developed a thrombosis once they've been on a NOAC, or well, if they had any bleeding, then you tend to measure. Even if somebody comes with a Debbie Gatron bleed, I don't tend to use it straight away, the prax spine. We tend to see what the clotting parameters are and when they last had the Debbie Gatron before we give away the prax spine, which is quite expensive prox. So we just tend to think about or prior to urgent situation surgery or in patients with deteriorating renal function. So this is what you will get if you're going to do a coagulation screen on a patient on a NOAC. So with regards to dabigatran, what will be useful is the thrombin time. So if the thrombin time is normal in a patient, we can safely say there's no dabigatran effect in the patient. So say a patient comes in for urgent surgery, and if the thrombin time is normal, <coughs> then I would say, please go ahead. No need to you know, give praxpoint or either sumumab. But the epixaban and rivaroxaban doesn't have much of an effect on the APTT. The rivaroxaban has an effect on the prothrombin time. So if the prothrombin time is still elevated in 24 hours, though it has a short half-life, that means there's still some rivaroxaban effect. Of course, it's not a direct correlation, but it just gives us some idea. Whereas the prothrombin time is not directly relational to epixaban. What will be useful for epixaban, rivaroxaban, and edoxaban is to measure uh, anti 10 a calibrated to the drug. So in Colchester, we can do it. So on a named patient basis, after discussion with the hematologist, at least between nine and five, we can get it done. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very difficult. And probably in a bigger center, I don't know whether Cambridge has it. Is anyone from Cambridge? I know King's College has it. So a few centers have it, but it's very difficult. If we can get it done, it will be useful. But that is more specific of the drug in the body rather than any of the PT, APTT, or 
thrombin time. Whereas with the dabigatran, thrombin time would be a useful test, and you can do it in the Maybe it's an academic question, but what's different between doing an anti 10 a for flexing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think things. this, if you calibrate it with the dabigatran, it's a very laboratory question, laboratory based yeah. question. It gives you the drug level if you calibrate it. The machine has to be calibrated, you know, the apparatus has to be calibrated against the okay. and the reagent and everything is very different. So it's not like the routine anti that you do for flexing. Yeah. It has to be done again, so the Roxabin, I'm not really sure, I haven't done it myself, sure, but that's how you do it. And from the anti level, you can interrupt how much uh, of the Roxabin or Epixaban in your system. There is a table that tells you there's still some Roxabin or Epixaban in the system. How long does it take? The, uh, if somebody can do it, you can get the result in 20 to 30 minutes, but it depends on the expertise and whether the lab can do it. Yeah, even in our lab, it's not standardized and things, but just to help out in some <coughs> patients, then we tend to get it done. So this is for the laboratory monitoring. Uh, as I said, for epixaban, idoxaban, and rivaroxaban, best is to get an anti a and for debigatran, a dilute thrombin time will be good enough. Oh, this is just uh, expected trough and peak level for the normal dosing of debigatran, rivaroxaban, and epixaban, and um, So when would I do levels apart from emergency surgery or anything? One will be if somebody's got a renal impairment, then I'd like to know what their anti 10 level is, or somebody with an overdose. Extremes of weight. There have been like patients who just can't manage on warfarin or flexane and they need injections. Young patients who've got very bad post thrombotic syndrome who needs lifelong anticoagulation. Then if I'm can if I'm keeping them on anticoagulant, the newer anticoagulant, then I would like to do what the trough level or a peak level is. And adherence to a patient, we've got many of the youngsters coming in with the recurrent clots and say they are compliant with the medication, all you have to do is do a level and then you know they won't be taking. Because it makes a difference. If they develop the clot whilst they are on a newer anticoagulant, which means I can't give it to them and I have to put them on water. But if I know they're not being compliant, at least there's a question of talking, I'll know. And prior to surgical procedure. So role of reversal agents, only for a major life-threatening hemorrhage, urgent reversal for surgery or a procedure, overdose, sometimes providing peace of mind to patients considering doing therapy, just because some people are put off just because there's no antidote and they rather stick with warfarin or flexin rather than going on the DOAC. And saying that with overdose, I have been told by the neuroxidant group, the Bayer reps, that the maximum absorption is only 50 milligrams, even if you take an overdose. I really don't know how that works, but that's what she says. And all the drug reps say that, because I do have a patient in Colchester who keeps coming in with overdoses. She's only 21. She not only overdoses on warfarin, on flexane too, believe it or not, she stabs herself 25 times. Yeah, she's got lots of, so we tried thinking what I should put her on. But um, yeah, that's what the Gavroxidin drug says. The maximum ceiling of absorption is 50 milligrams. I thought about starting her on reversal, but I'm not done it yet. <laughs> She's off anticoagulation now. So, <laughs> this is where <laughs> I told her she'd rather die of a PE rather than coming in with an overdose of one of these DOACs or flexane. So, uh, this is where we use reversal agents. As you all know, only reversal agent we have is for uh, Debigatran. This is just the consensus, but again, every hospital has its own pathway. So for warfarin, this is from the ACC consensus that you give based on the INR, the dose of the prothrombin complex concentrate is different. We have totally a different uh, anticoagulation guidance. Some people tend to use a fixed dose of octoplex, like 8,000 or 1,500, irrespective of the INR. And for debigatran, the dose is simple, praxbine or idirisumumab. Two doses of 2.5 grams <coughs> given 15 minutes apart. If they come in quite soon after ingestion, then you can try activated chemical. And for the others, epixaban, idoxaban, and rivaroxaban, the SPC of the drug says 25 to 50 international units of octoplex per kilogram. But again, we tend to use a fixed dose of 1500 or 2000 rather than you know, making them big. Is, is Antex that? Looking like it's going to be easy. Yes, so. hopefully. And I was going to talk about it next to that. So uh, it is, I think, FDA approved, but you should. The dosing is so different and it's a bit more complicated. And it's different for epixaban, different for rivaroxaban, and different for epoxaban. 
So it will be a bit complicated, but hopefully it should be soon in the market. So only licensed, nice licensed is the Debigatron reversal agent, which is the Idorosumumab. map. I call it Rex1, much easier to pronounce. So it's a humanized monoclonal fragment that specifically binds to Debigatron and its metabolites. And it doesn't cause any procoagulant people have asked because octoplex is prothrombotic, so you want to think twice about it. Whereas from the studies, it has not shown any documented thrombosis when you've used it for reversal. And it's IV administered, and there's an immediate onset of action, as I said, two doses of 2.5 gram, 15 minutes apart. You have to run it past your consulting hematologist and all hospitals stock it. We have had to use it at least three, four times. I think we had a AAA and Eurison bleed as well who needed it the last time. So, but Debigatrin is not the flavor among the flavor of choice of drug for among the hematologists. It's more the stroke physicians who tend to use the Debigatrin. We tend to use more rivaroxaban and pixaban and oxaban for our VTE patients. It's more for AF and stroke prevention because the 150 milligram BD has shown superiority over warfarin. So many stroke physicians tend to use it. Yeah, it's very difficult to say. <laughs> and Axinet is the one that is a recombinant protein of factor 10A with high affinity to all the direct factor 10A inhibitors. It's an IV infusion and it's very dosing regimen based on DOAC. So it's still ongoing phase three trials. So hopefully it will be nice approved in a year or two, I guess. So this was the phase three study, which came about and showed that it works very well for both epixaban and rivaroxaban. If you want, it's in a it's an NEJM paper. There's more talks again. I'm struggling to pronounce this. Siraparantac. It's a synthetic small molecule. It's not only used for the DOAX. It can be used for the low molecular weight heparin, heparin, and everything. Basically, it binds calcium silators and sodium citrate. And uh, this might be coming up soon too. So hopefully, in the next three to five years, we'll have more molecules that will be used as antidotes. So coming to bridging before surgery, it's very simple. I'm sure all hospitals will have different pathways about when to stop. Uh, it's based on the hemorrhagic risk, the bleeding risk of the surgery, and the thrombotic risk of the patient. And we all know DOAX have got quick onset and quick offset of action. So there's no need for bridging with clexane, like how you would do for warfarin. So ideally, you stop it for 24 to 48 hours before surgery, and then restart again once hemostasis is achieved either day one or day two postoperatively. Different hospitals have different guidance because I've looked up online. Each center has got its own guidance about when to stop and when to restart based on the bleeding risk of the surgery. But in this hospital, I've got the guidance here. It's still in the draft version, but we stop, tend to stop at 48 hours before surgery and then restart day one or day two postoperatively once the surgeons are happy. The only time that we start clexane from the end of the surgery is if there is a higher thrombotic risk. Yes? So you know you said some of the agents you need to cover them with clexane when you reintroduce them. The protocol. Oh, yes. Do you have to do that after no, surgery? No, no, no. Yeah. That's only for initiation of treatment for treating a DVT or VTE. Okay. Yeah. So you have to have a longer stopping time. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 when all of the drugs tend to stop it a bit longer for 72 hours if they've got a real impairment. I was not going to go, I have slides here, so you would be getting copies of it. So it just talks about based on the threat and clearance how long you need to stop it before. But in general, I would say stop at least 24 to 48 hours before the intervention. And the covenant with appendicitis, if the surgeon can wait for 24 hours, it would be ideal because I would avoid giving prothrombin compressed spread. If they can't avoid, then you try to optimize and then take them to data after giving all sorts of products <laughs> to misters. So, uh, this you should know, high bleeding risk procedures and low bleeding risk procedures. And uh, this is in general, they say time from last dose of DOAC to a procedure for low risk bleeding, you have to wait for two to three half lives for high-risk bleeding, four to five half-lives. Again, as I said, each trust and each place has its own things. So a rough idea is 48 hours before procedure. So there are various bridging guidance. I've got it here. I'm not going to elaborate on this, but you will be getting copies of the slides, which is quite self-explanatory. And the only high thrombotic risk procedures will be with mechanical heart valves or people who have had a recent DVT in the last three months or 
antiphospholipid antibody syndrome where we might say give a treatment dose get say when you're off the body gas. So this is again for the period management based on the low bleeding risk and high bleeding risk for the various drugs based on again the creatinine clearance. Yeah, that's about it. I've got we do have the bleeding guidance for our trust here, but I'm sure all of you will have your own guidance based on the hospital that you work, but you Don't can get it. copies of it if you want. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is a period of bridging, I think, right? All right. This was it a PDF? It was a oh no, this is a practice. So this is the Colchester Hospital for the the Idarisumab. But you can give it to them or you take yeah. patients rather than yeah. yeah. And there's a bridging guidance too, so you'll get a copy of that. But any questions? So when you say procedure, does that include your axial block? Yes, it seems to have a slightly different time, but 48 hours seems to be. No, 48 hours is quite a bit, but you actually proceed with like the uh, No, I think 24 hours should no. be sufficient, but I'll be a bit careful. I might want to do an antitinic. If it's an elective procedure, then probably it depends. I would. Uh, it's most common in, you know, like fractured like epithelium and elderly people. Right. They seem to be leaving it around 48 hours. Or you know, you better if it's going to be an elective procedure. Yeah. Or I might say, do it with a GA rather than an elective Because you just don't want to end up having a spinal hematoma and a bleach, you see. Unless your trust can do an antitene or both of those, then you can give you a better idea and then you can sign your Does this um, shop on tech as well? The um, I think so. yeah. it will be a normal, but how can we get it? It's very difficult. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, and yes. some of them are licensed for AI. Yes. For all, for, all of them. Yeah, um, not um, for like post hip and knees. Post hip and knees. Uh, so what if you're one for your AI? You have your hip and knees. Yes. Would you then change the yeah, NOAC or would you just use, even though it's not licensed, would you just use the one of them? So, the apart from the doctor, yeah. then, all the other three are licensed yeah. for thermal uh, prophylaxis. Yeah. I'll probably continue the same rather than putting them on flexing or something for five weeks and then changing. Yeah. And, Mama, why do you certain, um, so why, why doesn't everyone go um, by the back time for now? So, why do the hematologists prefer Pixaban? I think the side effect profile, there's a bit more of upper GI bleed and things to the that we get from the studies. And uh, we prefer the dobroxidin and the pixel over the others because there's a better safety profile yeah, for bleeding risk and things. Yeah. But the Debigetra and the 150B is associated with a lot of bleeding. So in the stroke, the stroke team, Debigetra can be given at 150B and 110B. So uh, the younger fit stroke patients get the 150B. That's the one that shows the second year. They're the ones in BD. Many people tend to go for Rivaroxaban and Edoxaban because it's once a day. Right, yeah, the it's more for the emergency one than the renal impairment and other things. <laughs> Yeah, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, uh -huh. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, really.